get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello, BYWG Tribe. This is Dr. Noah. Here is a quick peek at our supplement, product, and book of the month for May 2020. At the end of the podcast, I'll spend a few minutes going into further detail, so we encourage you to listen to the end. The supplement of the month for May is our Deep Sleep Assist. The 10% discount code for the month of May is SLEEP10. That's all lowercase. It's case-sensitive. It's S-L-E-E-P-10. Our book of the month is High Fiber Keto, a 22-day science-based plan to fix your metabolism, lose weight, and balance your hormones. Our product, Company of the Month, is Pretty Frank, formerly called Primal Pit Paste. 100% natural ingredients, zero cosmetic BS. All the links, discount codes, and special offers for the product, supplement, and book will be listed in the show notes and iTunes, posted on social media, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfora, and I am thrilled to have with me our most returning guest, otherwise known as the Alec Baldwin of the Beyond Your Wildest Genes show, Rob Wolf. I I don't know if I have enough hair to qualify for that. (laughs) I'll do what I can. Well, uh, it's uh, we 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 try to go out into the world and, and spread what we think is really important and what we love doing. I love talking to you. Um, you are a, a font of information. And um, I, I you, you started something r- brand new and I, I don't haven't seen it done much before. And I've got to tell you, as part of the Healthy Rebellion community, um, it, I love what you've done it is super you are super active as the host and and i deeply appreciate that um and not just opinion but backed by facts so i i really want to dive into the whys of why you did this after the what was it 10 was it 10 years of um the paleo solution yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. So we uh, we've been in this scene a long time. So my wife and I co-founded the first and fourth CrossFit affiliate gyms in the world and kind of helped the the whole CrossFit scene, you know, uh, do what it's done. And then we were very early in the paleo diet scene. And so, you know, when CrossFit first hit the interwebs, they started posting daily content and this was something so entirely novel and new prior to this web pages were pretty static like whatever the content was that was it and it was before wordpress and so updating things you needed to be a computer engineer practically to get anything done so things tended to be fairly static and they had figured out a way to you know, post some updated daily content, which included a workout of the day. And this was effectively the beginning of blogging, like before there was even a term for blogging. Sure. And we, you know, we saw the the world motor forward. Um, Google uh, became this indispensable tool and it provided a democratization to uh, information access at a minimum and also provided an opportunity for people who maybe weren't Sometimes formally trained, sometimes not formally trained, you know, like a, a engineer who took an interest in type 1 diabetes might might go real deep on it and come up with some very different uh, conclusions than people trained in a, a classical medical setting. And, you know, it was pretty interesting and, and honestly pretty liberating and exciting. But I, I got to say, maybe as far back as 2010, I want to say, which is when I launched my first book and the the first podcast, uh, one morning, um, I had some, some, uh, messages from Chris Kresser and Mark Sisson. And I was like, huh, that's weird. You know, I, I talk to those guys regularly, but it, it's, it was very strange that I had, you know, uh, late night messages from both of them. And they said, Hey, have you noticed that your site traffic has dropped off? And, we started poking around and what, what this was kind of the beginning of what has been a multi iteration story where uh, Google has has really endeavored to own 
the health wellness medical space. Like they kind of want to own the, the, the real estate there. And it, there've been multiple iterations where we would tweak and algorithmically, you know, uh, placate these guys. And then your site traffic would go back up. And if you had something to sell, you could sell it. And, you know, in, in theory, help people as a consequence of that. But uh, around what I guess, March or April of 2019, both on Facebook and uh, uh, our, our website, we noticed this just precipitous drop in, in uh, you know, sales and traffic. And then a, a couple of news pieces popped up that there had been an algorithmic update and a whole host of kind of low carb um, uh, ancestral health related sites had seen a, a, up to a 97% haircut in their traffic due to the, the algorithm updates. And, and some of this stuff, it, it's really interesting. Like some of it's it, it pretty extreme kind of anti-vaccine stuff. And I know that that's just a, a hot button topic. Like if you picked abortion and political parties, like mm -hmm. you, you maybe couldn't get more hot button stuff, but there, there were some sites that even for me, like I'm, I'm, um, uh, and this is going to anger people right out of the gate, but I'm, I'm a, a vaccination cautious. Like, I think that they are amazing tools. I think that they get overused in, in some cases and, and in others. Uh, we don't fully vet out the, the cost benefit story very well, but um, I'm in this kind of middle ground where I, 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 I don't see conspiracies around every corner, but at the same time, I see some real... Uh, uh, lack of transparency and honesty and stuff like that. So some concerning features. But it, it, what was interesting is there were some very extreme folks that were uh, given this haircut. And then there was a whole nesting of other folks that, you know, and clearly self-interest. I, I was, you know, in that group. So clearly I'm going to say that it was unfair and sure. not right and sure. all that stuff. But, you know, it, there was just kind of a basic reality that our, our ability – on, on one day, uh, someone searching for information about the vegan film, What the Health, if they put What the Health into a search engine, the third or fourth uh, return on the front page would have been a, a massive review that I did where I went literally line by line through this two-hour film and said, here's the person, here's what they claimed, here's the material they used to support it, and here's my take on that. And I, I mean, it was a massive amount of work, and it, it was a very high-traffic page that I had, one of many, many pages that were, you know, number one uh, search returns because I had really put a ton of effort into, you know, in theory, trying to do a good work. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, if you search for what the health, the the same page showed up on page 35, page 40. And we were given all kinds of ridiculous commentary that, oh, you just need to do some better, you know, website SEO optimization and stuff like that. And it, it's kind of like, how does an algorithmic tweak um, take something that had been number one page and stick it on number 40 page like that? That that seems kind of odd, but we. You know, we were really faced with a, a decision. Do we keep motoring forward? And if so, in what medium do we do that? Because all of these information monopolies, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, um, they've really established a, a history of censorship, for lack of a better term. And I know that people get kind of prickly around that where they they will say, you know, they're a private business, they can do what they want. And I'm of the opinion that these entities have been kind of straddling both sides of very clear fence. Like mm -hmm. if you if you run a business and you have people, you know, doing um, something that looks like your business and you're selling elements of that, there's a really clear distinction between a franchise and an affiliate. And I mean, it's it's crystal clear stuff and you can get on the bad side of the government very quickly by claiming to be an affiliate, but actually doing franchise type things. And similarly, there's a very clear distinction between being a platform and a publisher. And the thing is, is in the, the recesses of history, things like the, the telephone company have been given a, 
a pass with regards to litigation. Uh, you know, if somebody uses a phone or the phone system to organize a terrorist attack, that's not necessarily the fault of the phone system because it's a, you know, it's a, a service effectively. And right. so some of this has been applied to other media outlets, but what the reality is that when you get into the game of deciding what is true and what is not true, you are a publisher. You're no longer just a platform, but the, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they've, they've done a very masterful job of kind of straddling both sides of that and using um, the, the perks and privileges of, of each distinction kind of to, to their benefit. And they are very smart people, very powerful people, but they, in my opinion, they've developed some remarkable hubris in that because they're smart and because they're powerful, they've assumed that they are right about everything. And they've kind of woven a social political kind of agenda into the mix, which includes a kind of a vegan diet and a very specific take on uh, climate change and what have you. So it was a, it was a pretty big deal. I mean, I, I effectively woke up one day and realized that my work was of sufficient magnitude or, or, you know, what, however you want to label it, that these information monopolies had decided to try to make it disappear from the, the interwebs, you know, make it very, very difficult to find. And so Nikki and I kind of had a conversation. Is this where we hang a gone fishing sign and we do something else? Or do we, you know, double down and uh, uh, try to um, circumvent this process? And we went for the latter and we ended up on a platform called Mighty Networks. And the, the woman who founded Mighty Networks, uh, Gina Bianchini, she's been pretty outspoken about, uh, you know, being respectful of, of private information and, and folks having the ability to generate and curate the information that they want and, and not having kind of a Orwellian censorship type, type process. So we opted for for going on to that platform and we opted for a paid membership site because our sense was that the easy access and anonymity of social media platforms did not bode well for people comporting themselves with any type of, of decency or, or, you know, friendliness. And if there was a dispute to be had, you know, maintaining some civility there. So there was a hope that, a, uh, a paywall would keep out the riffraff. And I've been working on a medical risk assessment program for the better part of 10 years where we identified some very high risk uh, police and firefighters, high risk for type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, we got these folks on a lowish carb paleo type diet about eight years ago. And the changes that these folks experienced uh, were so profound that the, the very conservative estimates were that the pilot study saved the city of Reno about $22 million with a 33 to one return on investment. And so I've been working to scale this for quite some time. And I kind of saw an opportunity at, at this juncture to really throw some gasoline on that concept. And so when we were contemplating what we would call this whole thing and what the kind of mission was. Uh, we, we were at a, a conference and somebody had mentioned a uh, Camus, um, Albert Camus quote, and I'm gonna totally butcher it, but it was something like, in a unfree world, your, your only way to be truly free is to make your very existence an act of rebellion. And I was, I kind of put a spin on that and it was in an unhealthy world the only way to be truly healthy is to make your very existence an act of rebellion. And so we called this thing the healthy rebellion. And we have a goal of liberating 1 million people out of the sick care system. And we have a three point element to that. And the first point is we need to identify folks and establish what their metabolic health is. Hopefully it's good, but if it, it whether it's good or, or needs improvement, the second part of this story is that folks need access to well-trained functional medicine, integrative medicine practitioners and health coaches because we don't affect diet and lifestyle change in a vacuum. We have to have support. We have to have good guidance. And then the third piece is probably the most controversial piece, but I honestly think possibly the most important piece, which is trying to get people out 
of the third party payer system. And so I've been looking very closely at the creation of a, a MediShare. MediShares have historically been these entities that exist within religious organizations. And about 60 years ago, there were some exemptions created for uh, religious entities to create health shares where everybody pays into a pool, they delineate what is covered and what is not covered. And by the legal definition of the law, it's not insurance, although it looks a hell of a lot like insurance to me, but that's a, that's a, a legal distinction there. But these things have functioned really well. And what's interesting about them is they allow for some inclusion exclusion criteria, which uh, allows uh, for some some aligning of incentives, you know, healthier people will pay less and less healthy people will pay more or they may not be allowed to be part of the system. And uh, so we've been motoring forward on that. And we I, I think, as you alluded at the outset, we closed up uh, the original Paleo Solution podcast, which ran for 10 years, had 440 some odd episodes and uh, we founded the Healthy Rebellion Radio, the Healthy Rebellion Salty Talk, which is where I kind of do interviews. And then we have the Healthy Rebellion you know, uh, uh, network where a good number of folks now, yourself included, um, do some really amazing work. We, we host 30-day uh, resets uh, quarterly to help people get a really focused period of time to improve their sleep, their food, their movement, their community interactions. And, you know, we, we did one reset pre-COVID and we did one reset in the middle of COVID. And it was um, it was pretty striking how important that although virtual community was, how critical it became to uh, uh, the folks in the Healthy Rebellion. It, it is. Let me let me dial back. And I agree with you a thousand percent. I mean, you can't make that up. The the com what I think, hold on, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So when you initially said this, I said, let me be a good little scientist here and let me um, let me take a look at this. Not that I didn't believe you, but I just wanted to take a look. So I looked up Rob Wolf, and you were always you always came up on the first page. Not only were you not on the first page, and this was this was back when you introduced this, so. This was when when did Healthy Rebellion start? Was it February or we launched it around October, October. I believe, last right. year. Yeah. Yeah. So I immediately went and Googled Rob Wolf and you always came up first. But not only were you not first, not only were you not on the first page, but all of the negative stuff popped up before it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's just bizarre. Let me let me pull up Joe Mercola because Joe Mercola has the, the, the biggest health or at least he did healthcare website in the world. Not only was Mercola not on the first page, every single quack watch, every single derogatory comment that you could find was listed before you could actually get to Mercola. Right. I pulled up Sisson. I pulled up Cresser. And it was across the board, almost as if they, like you said, they just decided that their algorithm could no longer support this. And it always goes back to we, we, we learn this in school as chiropractors. You got to follow the money trail. And at some point, the censorship that is going on. The, the money that was being thrown their way had to be overwhelming for them to do that. And you can't, you can't run a business that way. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And again, like I try to not go too crazy on the conspiracy stuff, but about eight months before this algorithm update went down, uh, there was a, a transaction between Google and GlaxoSmithKline to the tune of 600, $800 million. And I, I honestly forget which, direction the money went, but um, there have been some news pieces generated that that make the case that you you could you could have a pretty tight argument saying that Google is now a biotech company. Mm -hmm. and, and biotech company with some very, very uh, serious interest in vaccines. 
uh, mm-hmm. because of the, you know, the kind of cross pollination of the investments and whatnot. And it, 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 again, it's, you know, some things are just kind of glaringly obvious. It's like, okay, big exchange of money, somebody with some serious investments in, in vaccines. There's a group of people that, like, interestingly, for whatever reason, maybe they're 100% right. Maybe it's a, a, a correlation, not causation deal. But a lot of folks in the kind of low-carb scene are pretty uh, cagey about the vaccine topic. I And, and again, just uh, for my own position i think some of these folks go way over the top i think that they they uh it, it's always fascinating to me the real extreme um conspiracy theory folks i i don't feel like i have like a a deep insight into the world but i think i have a view that the world functions much more like an avalanche roaring down a hillside than it does a swiss watch like there <laughs> there are people that have this sense that wh- whether they think that there's like a uh, divine entity that runs everything or they think that there's a cobble of you know 13 families that run the world and they run everything via via puppet strings and i think that it's actually just just barely north of absolute stark raving mag chaos. And there's just this kind of little bit of, of inertia that comes together and creates what we call um, civilization. But that said, it, it's not too unreasonable to, to see, you know, so the, the massive amount of pushback that has occurred around vaccines and vaccination. And then you've, you've got two mega powerful business entities that clearly have some sort of an investment in this scene. And they've decided that they're going to curate what they believe to be the truth on this topic. And then by extent, and they've got a, uh, you know, from the world health organization on down, there's a very specific view of climate change and what needs to be done around climate change and human health. And in all of this stuff, the kind of vaccine topic, animal husbandry, uh, climate change, they all circle together. And again, I don't want to paint it as a conspiracy theory, but at the same time, it's a it's a reasonably simple story. Some of these, in, in my mind, I, I, again, could be totally wrong, but uh, these folks have kind of decided that, you know, like animal products, in their opinion, are dangerous to humans and dangerous to the environment. And so, quote, something needs to be done about that. And that something is curating material that is very pro-vegan and is very anti-paleo, low-carb, keto, meat-inclusive, you know, any discussion around regenerative agriculture like these. uh, Another cross-section of people that have been just gutted are small-time farms. You know, these folks doing regenerative agriculture and like if they post pictures of chickens being butchered or something like that, which I I, you don't have to go and take this stuff in if you don't want to. But having the realities of life and death put out there and like exposing our food system, that seems like a good thing to me. And that's an amazing bit of transparency for a small time operator to show, hey, this is how we butcher and process these animals. And this is the respect we put into that. And if somebody morally feels that, that they don't want to eat meat, that, that's fine. But I just, I, I find something uh, incredibly powerful with that transparency. But yet these people in trying to be transparent get reported as having inappropriate content. And then they, they go from being able to sell their products at a, a you know, a, a net positive on Facebook and Instagram and different places to being only at break even. They can pay into Facebook, but they never make a red cent out of it. And uh, this is kind of the thing that we're all facing. And you know, you you mentioned a, a little bit of the the COVID stuff here before we started recording. Um, there's a lot of information out there on this, and uh, this is another one of these topics where. Any discussion around what could you do to be healthier and potentially better navigate this thing um, has been really roundly suppressed and and beaten down and kind of uh, thrown under the pseudoscience bus, which I I find incredible. We've been told all manner of things not to do. Don't go outside. Don't do this. Don't do that. But we've been told very few things to do. 
wash our hands, wear a mask, but there's nothing around get some vitamin D either supplementally or sit on your back porch and get some sun. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the high blood sugars are one of the, the worst indicators of how this is going to go for folks. And we know for a fact that with it, any type of favorable dietary change, we can dramatically improve blood sugars and metabolic health in a matter of days, weeks at the outset. So if we were being put on a a suggested lockdown that was going to last at least a couple of months, why not lead with, uh, you know, some recommendations around what can we do to mitigate our downside risk? And th this ended up, I, I know I'm kind of bouncing around, but this ended up being, uh, I think, one of the most important features of the Healthy Rebellion is very early on, um, I only shared material that I felt either better informed our understanding of the situation, which mm -hmm. I ended up abandoning that very quickly because it was just two polar extremes. Like either we're all going to die or there's absolutely no problem to be seen here, which that, that you know, that that's not true on either, right. either side of that, that right. equation. And so I kind of abandoned that early on, although we, you know, we did some, some analysis around like transmission and severity. And, and then we really focused a lot on, comorbidities. And mm -hmm. that was where we formulated a game plan. And this was based off the early, early data coming out of China, which again, I, I think is suspect in a lot of ways, but it was crystal clear at the outset of the COVID epidemic that folks with metabolic disease fared poorer mm -hmm. than folks that, that were healthy. Absolutely. Um, it, it, what we really don't know and will never know is what that um, denominator was of the people that had had it and are relatively healthy individuals. And then just what about their business? Because it really didn't, because they were metab metabolically sound, it presented as a, you know, a, a fever and, and a cough and, and it just right. went away. So we'll never know what that, what that denominator was. And, and that's the, that's the scary thing. These predictive models that are out there, they grossly over uh, grossly underestimated what that, what that number was. And we look at it now and what they say, New York, New York city, 25 million were tested or 15 million were tested. 25 had had it means that there were 4 million people that had had it, didn't know they had it. And the unfortunate part of that was there were people that did die from that. But when you look at that, their comorbidities were off the charts. Like they were in nursing homes. They were, um, what they're, what, what they're showing is they were, uh, had blood sugar dysregulation. They, they were just, they were, they were sick individuals to start with. And it, that's a lightning rod because the, you know, uh, I am a conspiracy theorist. Um, and why, why, like even talking to my, <laughs> talking to my, uh, primary, I was truth be told, I was in the hospital. I had bilateral pneumonia. I had, uh, COVID-19. Um, I had two doses of, um, hydrochloroquine and, uh, a Z pack. And in two days I felt better. The, the cost of that was, was minimal. Um, right. I, I am recovering still, but I am not, my, that's not my first go-to. My, I'm, I'm, I'm a chiropractor by profession. Um, taking meds is not my thing, but that all being said, there's a time and a place for everything. Right. I had, I had bilateral pneumonia. If I waited longer, God knows what the outcome would have been. Right. So, there's a time and a place for that. And it worked exactly the way it was supposed to work. I felt dramatically better. I'm released from the hospital. And, and now I'm on the road to recovery. The recovery is slow. Even my primary doctor, I mean, who is in the system and is a really good uh, doctor, he's a really good guy, said, this is a virus that I swear doesn't act like a virus. It's almost as if it were man-made. Like... Now, if you and I have had this conversation back in October, people would have said, well, Mike and Rob are out running in the fields. But now what we're seeing on the Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter is 
the censorship of anything or the mis or disinformation of hydrochloroquine uh, being a, a usable tool to help people. I, I, I don't believe that's by accident. I, I believe that's on purpose to create this misinformation. And I know we're down the rabbit hole and, and we're going to pull out of it in a minute, but um, it's, it's frightening. It is so pertinent that we're talking today about this exact thing. Um, there, there's never been a better time to actually talk about it. What it reminds me of is what Margaret Mead said when, when you decided to create the Healthy Rebellion Radio, Healthy Rebellion Community, um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I'll hang my hat on that every day. Absolutely. Now, yeah. now when when I first got involved in the Healthy Rebellion and I signed up and um, I... I, what it reminds me of is your your roots in CrossFit, because my my feeling is that CrossFit and and the iteration of those types of gyms are more about community. Don't get me wrong; you you are you get super healthy. I think a lot of people overdo it, but. I think it's much more about community and you have taken that of your roots and you've put it in an online community where it's uh, in my point of view and it's blossoming. And it just so happens it's during a pandemic where we're not allowed to be next to each other. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, uh, with my second book wired to eat, the we had four pillars of health sleep yep. food movement and community and and uh, it, it's sometimes kind of a, a tough sell to to paint the community as as powerfully as say like food and and whatnot we have some interesting studies that suggest that inadequate social connection is as you know injurious as a pack a day smoking habit and stuff like that but i think you know there have been some really interesting pieces looking at pandemics in general. And one of the, the most difficult features is that in most disaster scenarios, like a, there are accounts of when the, the uh, British were getting bombed during World War II and people were sleeping in, in uh, fallout shelters and, and whatnot, um, many people reported the rest of their lives that that was the, the best part of their life that they ever had. Yeah, it was scary and yeah, there were some some challenges to it, but the uh, people pulling together and putting differences aside, not just proximity to to other people, um, they reported it as being, you know, incredibly helpful and enjoyable. Whereas in a pandemic, you do exactly the opposite. You see someone and you run. And so that's, I, I think, been this this doubly injurious, you know, characteristic to this whole thing that where normally we would come together physically during, you know, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado or whatever and help rebuild and, you know, uh, 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 you know, care for loved ones, uh, you know, uh, bury them in a, you know, have a, a funeral. It's very difficult to do all that stuff now. So there's this really uh, crazy amount of kind of psychic damage that's occurring because of the distance imposed from a, an infectious agent. You know the 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 community part when you when you look at the blue zones of the world, the the one thing they have in common is community. They're mm -hmm. all all these blue zones are are community based. The people living the longest are community based. And I I'm an introvert by nature, but you know being being locked in place of home for a month, um, you get a little squirrely. Even, yes, you do. <laughs> you know, even just going out for a walk. But the the I just want to hit on this, and, and I've said this before uh, on other on our other um, interviews, is that all right? So, I during this time, I have got to spend family dinners for the first time in twenty three years with with my wife and my son and my daughter. 
Mm -hmm. And th I've had more dinners at home with my family than I have in 23 years, um, you know, on a Monday or Wednesday or Friday. So right. th there, there, are, there are these things. And I, I, I bring this up all the time. I heard on, uh, on another podcast, um, and I have to remember to look up who the um, person was, but our children, by the time they turn 18, will have spent 93% of th our time together. Yeah. From the time yeah. they're born to the time they're 18. That means if they live another, you know, if we happen to live another 60, 70 years, we will only spend 7% of their time with them. That is right. an amazing number. And I try and say that because it, it, it goes back to the community. It goes back to family. And that's what you've created with the Healthy Rebellion community. You've taken it out of the brick and mortar and you've put the soul into what you're doing because obviously it's what you believe to be true and what is necessary. Yeah, and you know, hopefully and empirically just uh, encouraging folks to kick the tires on it like they see benefit. You know, yes. so there's all kinds of theory out there, but, you know, it's like, does it actually benefit you? And so far, it seems like the answer is yes. And we're really looking forward to the day like we were just starting to plan some in-person activities. We were looking down the road at uh, 2021 doing a, a walking tour of parts of uh, uh, Spain. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're still optimistic about that, although clearly know what their travel can look like and what you know do you need a some sort of super invasive medical test to go in and out of countries and stuff so we're going to see how that goes but we are definitely looking down the road to augment this um virtual community which is is good it's helpful but getting some some nodes of connectivity in the real world i think are going to be critical going forward absolutely so you take it from the virtual into into the actual meet and greet and um activities i i think it's i think it's absolutely brilliant i i, I really appreciate the work that you do and and your thought that goes into it um it, i i am deeply grateful for it and oh, i would you. thank you I, I honestly um and, and i've said it to you before it's you know me picking up your book 10 years ago um, changed, saved our, our lives, not just myself, but my wife as well. That's um, awesome. Where can people find you in the world today? You know, I'm doing most of my time at the Healthy Rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, the URL for that is join.thehealthyrebellion.com. Um, I do virtually nothing on Facebook, almost nothing on Twitter at this point. I do some broadcasts to those mediums, but I don't. I don't answer questions and commentary because generally it's just not that <laughs> that favorable. I still yeah. do a little bit on Instagram that hasn't totally gone off the rails yet. But, uh, you know, like I did my I've been doing a yearly training and update uh, training and nutrition update post, you know, talking about yeah. my jujitsu and and what have you. And normally I post that on the blog. But this year the update went exclusively into the healthy rebellion and I just decided that if there are folks like you that are investing in me with your 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 money but also what I, I was reflecting on the more important thing is your time like that even though there's a there's a a dollar cost there um there's awareness now that um they're calling it the attention economy that the most important thing that you you know anyone can have is someone else's attention which is effectively time and so the fact that people are investing in the healthy rebellion means that that's where I'm going to focus my efforts. And so I, I still drip a little bit out here and there, you know, because it, it'd be nice to, to grow the core features of the rebellion and, and grab the good folks that, that are, you know, of a mind to participate in that. But the, the healthy rebellion is where about 99% of my activity goes now. Cool. And that, and that goes back to, when you look at, at, at attention economy and time, the the capstone at the top of this pyramid is engagement. And you mm -hmm. and Nikki and, and Squatchy are on it and you are fully engaged. And it's not not because 
it, it's because that's who you are. It's because what you believe. It's not because of a dollar sign. I don't see that at all. It's this is your baby and you are um, you are nurturing it and allowing allowing the community to grow organically. Oh, thank you. I mean, there there definitely is a, a financial interest there. Like if I'm going to do it, it's got to got to support me in the team. But, um, you know, we we really do try to provide an asymmetric return on the, the investment there. So like we, we work hard to uh, be engaged, provide good content um, and, and just kind of foster a solid community. So, yeah, thank you. you you're you're as I as I told my wife. Um, you are crushing this pandemic. <laughs> Doing what I can. It's a very stout foe, so we've got our hands full, that's for sure. Absolutely. In our house, if if it has a surface, it's been painted. If it if it can be replaced, she's replaced it. Except for me, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Rob, I really appreciate your time. Um, it, folks, it's join dot the healthy rebellion dot com correct rob yes yep awesome um i i cannot highly i can't recommend you take a look at this uh i think you'll love it it is people are so genuine and it is so well received uh i really would um highly recommend to check it out so Folks, if you like what you heard today, please go to iTunes. Oh, is there anything else you want to impart before we leave? No, no. Just uh, thank you again for being the huge supporter you've been for for ages. And, you know, I I guess if I, you know, some words of wisdom, uh, you know, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with the, the information that's thrown at us. Like we have health and politics, and social stuff, climate and all that. And it's, it's easy to, to just be like, okay, I'm going to check out, I'm done or to make a real uh, ill informed decision on something. And I, I guess one thing I would encourage people, and I don't want to be preachy about this, but it, it's great to have strongly held convictions but if if your background in the topic is let's say superficial uh it, it maybe don't fully invest like in in a religious manner you know your your belief in investment in like i i, I am um continually uh chagrined by the things that i i thought i knew and did not and the cool thing about getting something that I thought was right, proven wrong, is it, it hopefully I'm able to learn and grow from that. And I, I see far too little of that process, that iterative process where it's, it, it's great to have some opinions and, and some thoughts on things, but uh, really vet out what, what the, um, the sourcing and does this make sense? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, does the advice that folks provide, and again, this is whether it's like dealing with your financial life or, or really anything, does it provide a, a, a tool to affect change in your life? Or does it just get you emotional and therefore control you? And I, I'll, I'll leave it up to folks to decide which one of those they would they would prefer bring into their life. Well, you're, you're in good. I always appreciate that about you, Rob, is um, you can look at a topic and you can say, you know what, I reevaluated and, and I don't think that this was the exact way that it should be. Um, the company that you're in is, is uh, uh, this dude that people might have heard of. His name is Aristotle. And at 87 years old, Aristotle said, the more I learn, the more I realize, the less I know. Exactly. Something, I, I think I'm murdering that, but that's OK. People get the gist of it. So, Rob, thanks again for taking the time out um, again, folks. Please check it out at join.thehealthyrebellion.com. And um, if you like what you heard, please leave a review. We greatly appreciate it. And everyone have a great day. Thanks, Ciao. Doc. Ciao. Bye, Rob. It's Dr. Noah, and I'm back. I suspect you loved listening to this week's podcast release. Our book of the month is High Fiber Keto, a 22-day science-based plan to fix your metabolism, lose weight, and balance your hormones by Naomi Wittell. 
You can listen to my interview with Naomi at the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast archives, date April 20th, 2020, just a few weeks ago. The link to purchase will be in all our emails, social media, and in the show notes. Our product of the month is Pretty Frank, formerly called Primal Pit Paste. Pretty Frank is committed to making safe, high-quality, and earth-friendly products without compromise. Their line consists of deodorant, body care, oral care, and skin care products. One of their taglines is 100% natural ingredients, zero BS. No aluminum, no parabens, no harsh chemicals. Very timely, they just released a brand new hand purifier as well, scented with eucalyptus and lavender essential oils. Our supplement of the month is BYWG's Deep Sleep Assist. Deep Sleep Assist is a specialized combination of scientifically backed herbs, minerals, adaptogens, and amino acids that help you get to sleep, stay asleep, and achieve deeper levels of sleep so you wake rested and renewed. The May 4th podcast release will be a deeper dive into this unique effective sleep aid. The 10% discount code for the month of May is SLEEP10. That's lowercase S-L-E-E-P-10 whether you order online or pick up at the office. If you have any questions or comments, please never hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you for your time and be awesome and never unawesome.